Yes, welcome everyone to the very last talk for 2020 of some. <laughs> last one. No pressure. And, and we have the great privilege of having Dr. Tim Boyket. Did I pronounce your sermon correct? Close enough. <laughs> okay. So it's a great privilege of having him here. He is um, highly recommended by Dr. Karen Howell. So um, under her recommendation, I asked him to give us a talk today. He is, <clears throat> he is involved with Times Up, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, and the Johannes Kepler University in Linz. And he'll be talking to us about the future is full of mathematics. <laughs> so um, without further ado, Tim, take it away. Right. Um, Lawrence, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's uh, probably one of the strangest places I've had to give a uh, give a talk, um, but we'll do our best. In 2020 is uh, being an interesting way that we're learning how to do all sorts of things new. Um, so this is carrying on. Uh, for those of you who didn't pick up the discussion beforehand, I'm currently in hotel quarantine in Australia, having got a, a surprise flight last week. I was meant to be in Austria still. And my wife, child, and I are now in a, a small hotel room for two weeks, unable to go outside. So I'm giving this talk from the soundproof booth known as the bathroom. Uh, so hopefully the sound's quite decent. Um, yeah, Karen asked me whether I'd be interested in giving a, a talk because someone maybe asked her about some interesting mathematicians and she, she decided that I was the most interesting mathematician she knew, which I find um, not quite believable. But I'm probably one of the more confusing mathematicians that most people know because I still work as a research mathematician. Um, I try and publish a couple of papers every year to keep my toe in the water, so to speak. Um, but my main work is with a group called Times Up. We're based in Linz in the harbour. We uh, currently have a big project with the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. Um, and that uh, project is all around sort of futures literacy and the use of environments to communicate ideas about the future, workshops around the future, and this sort of thing. So when I was asked whether I could give a talk to like student group, I was like, OK, I'm, I'll sort of presume that uh, it's a very diverse group of mathematics students. So talking about my uh, sort of particular mathematical research areas might be a little bit baffling, um, though that's also fun. Uh, and then I thought, just a minute, as we've been going through this work in a very sort of organizational interactive sort of way, I keep seeing these interesting questions about um, sort of it, things that we, we, we need to do and that we then uh, need to, so let me just, um, let me just like get this going, blah, 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 blah. that, um, yeah, we keep on having to do this, solve these problems and deal with these issues, and they've got a strong mathematical character to them. So I thought, well, I could actually talk about this interaction between futures and mathematics and how these things interrelate to each other. And of course, once I started actually thinking that stuff out loud, um, I ended up with a, uh, a lot of things that um, all fit together around futures and mathematics, and I hopefully won't make them too confusing. Uh, do you still hear me? Yes, can you okay. hear me? Good, super good. Just glad to change to the screen. Hopefully you can now see the first slide of the of the ocean waves and the Times Up logo. Yes, I can see that. Yes. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, so I realized that there was all sorts of other sorts of interesting connections. So in the next 50 minutes or so, I'm going to, oh, I'll try and keep it shorter. Uh, I'm going to go through a bunch of ideas. Um, this is sort of aimed at a sort of general mathematics, mathematically interested audience. So hopefully it won't be too much repetition for too many of you. Um, and hopefully there'll be a couple of interesting bits in there that will sort of make you go, oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm going to try and finish a few minutes before two so that if anybody needs to leave, they um, want to ask a question, they can before uh, they have to leave. And um, if we talk for longer, then we talk for longer. And if we, if I race through this and get finished too quickly, then there's a video I'd like to show you about our work that might help contextualize it a bit more. Or at least one aspect of it. Um, so I used to, to Times Up is a small research, arts, culture, uh, technology organization. We've done work with virtual reality, with immersive storytelling, 
Um, we've done workshops and all sorts of things, teaching around the world, um, exhibitions with the Austrian Cultural Forum. We did, uh, we have one of our pieces in the uh, Zimbabwe National Arts Museum, which was nice. And we have another one of our little tiny fragments uh, in an art collection in Johannesburg, strangely enough, because uh, as part of a residency where I was there visiting people, I had to leave a an object for their collection, and so I left them a very small object, which was quite, quite fun. So what are we going to be talking about today? The whole idea of foresight culture or future studies um, often gets mixed up with something called futurism, which sounds a little bit like uh, people telling us what the future is going to be like. Some of you might know that Al Gore a couple of years ago released a book called The Future, um, which follows on a long line of uh, books that talk about how the future is going to be. Um, people like to do this, especially uh, big important people who do a lot of thinking about things, they get to a point where they think they know how the future is going to be. Alvin Toffler talked a lot about this stuff in the 70s, um, writing with his wife, uh, Heidi Toffler, uh, with Future Shock. You might know the expression Future Shock came from a book that he wrote. Um, and futures as a sort of discipline has existed in some serious way uh, for about the past 70 years, so basically since the end of the Second World War or a little bit before that. Of course, the threads go back a lot further than that, um, and we're going to try and talk about that as well. Um, and we'll be going through all these ideas of what foresight culture, what future studies, what they might mean, what it might mean to actually be thinking about the future and thinking about the future together. Um, and so we're going to go through some ideas and then hopefully we'll get to something that's interesting for you as well. Um, so, of course, these are the traditional classical ways of talking about the future. Um, before we had things, we used to use all sorts of uh, things that we could actually do proper prognoses. Um, people used all sorts of strange and weird techniques and believe that there was a connection between the lines on your hand and what was going to happen in your life. They would um, read the entrails of pigs that have been slaughtered, all sorts of other things. Interestingly enough, some of these things actually have some coherence to them. Uh, there are reasons to believe that by looking at the digestive tracts of animals, you know what the animals are eating and what's happening to them and how they are reacting to the world around them. And the world, the world around them is developing in a certain way. And sometimes, apparently, I can't vouch for this because I haven't done this work, um, there is enough information in like the fatty deposits of animals uh, to be able to say, okay, the next winter is going to be stronger, be a heavy winter, because of the amount of uh, food these animals have put into storage. Because they, they, for some reason, they've got better ways of knowing this. They've had several million years to evolve and, and learn how to do these things. Of course, most of these things, crystal balls um, and tarot cards, are just ways of distracting people or focusing people on something, being able to ask them a bunch of interesting questions. And it's essentially applied psychology, working out what people want to hear told to them about their lives um, or a way of doing uh, psychology on a very basic level. Um, but one of the things that people sort of uh, were confronted with in the, the ancient world was the fact that the world was pretty unpredictable. They had people around them, they had animals, they had weather, they had nature, they had natural catastrophes. catastrophes. Things just happened all the time in a relatively chaotic fashion. The one thing that they noticed didn't happen completely chaotically was the sun going up and down, the moon going up and down, the moon waxing and waning, uh, the movement of the fixed and unfixed stars in the firmament. And as people began to gain an understanding of these regularities and how they connect to things like the tides, um, they began to get some ideas of regularities in the world. And there is a, uh, a story um, to what degree it's actually true is also, of course, a, a open question about a, a wise old man. Of course, it's always a man. It might have been also a woman, but of course, the story says it's a wise old man who uh, knew the suns and the stars and the moon and knew that an eclipse was coming. So this was information was passed on to the king or the queen or empress or whoever it was around there. And there were some battles going on. And because the king could then announce in his infinite wisdom, um, that there was going to be an eclipse. Their soldiers were not going to be awestruck by this event. The opposing soldiers were going to be have the wits scared out of them, and they would be able to then overrun 
the opposing forces, which they did. Um, it's not really relevant where this was, this particular story, where it happened, um, if it actually really happened. But it's a very interesting idea that prediction, the idea to be able to predict what's going to happen, is very useful. Being able to say there will be an eclipse tomorrow, um, the moon will wax and wane, uh, is very useful. Knowing when rain is going to be coming is important for agriculture, but it's a bit harder to tell. The flooding of the Nile was one of these things that was related, uh, given to the, the priests as something to, to do. And there are also some stories that, based on certain developments in the water quality of the Nile, there were ways of predicting to a certain degree of accuracy what was going to happen. Um, but as John Casti, the mathematician and systems complex system scientist based in Vienna, likes to say, um, for a long time, astrology, astronomy were the only things that we really had to be able to have any idea of what sort of a structure in the world, have any sort of predictable um, structures to be able to work with. Uh, in some sense, knowledge is power in a very useful way, prediction. Um, so as they were doing all these observations of uh, when Easter was going to be and that sort of thing, the uh, fathers of the Catholic Church collected data over a long time and were able to make better and better predictions. They, they basically made observations, they worked out what was going on, they were able to make observations and based on those observations, uh, predictions on what was going to happen afterwards. Um, and so people like Kepler were able to make the uh, descriptions of the equal areas carved out in a certain time by the movement of planets as then began to model things uh, appropriately and were able to make uh, important and valuable contributions to sort of predictability and what was going on. Um, Kepler also had this wonderful view of the, uh, the solar system with all these beautiful uh, structures, the music of the spheres, the way that the um, planets' orbits were related to one another by the sonic, sonic solids. And so there was a lot of interpretation of results and just making a lot of observations and working out what's going to happen next based on that. And strangely enough, this is very close to what's happening now, um, at least as far as I understand it, with big data. Big data doesn't try and interpret, big data just looks at data and uh, models it and works out ways of carrying on predictions into the future uh, without knowing what's underneath it. It took someone like Newton to come along and to come up with these sort of laws of gravitational attraction that then explained the idea behind why the planets were making certain types of motion. And we can now do those calculations, and I think we will do them in first year university, where we calculate based on uh, some calculus derivations, the orbits of planets, and we sort of know how this works. So in some sense, we get we can go one layer behind the observations and have an idea of what's going on at a higher level, a why. Um, and this, this relates to a very sort of nice problem around sort of prediction um, and knowing what's going to happen in the future based on what we know already, uh, which is known to some people as the turkey problem. Um, if you're a turkey and you're born and you become aware of your world, um, then you basically wake up in the morning with the sun, strut around a bit, someone comes and gives you fresh water and a bunch of grain, and you strut around and you eat and you drink and you're surrounded by your mates every day. And every day you get a better, observational basis for your hypothesis that the farmer loves you. The farmer wants you to have the better world, best possible world into the future until slaughter day happens um, because you don't understand the structure behind what it is that you're actually living in a farmyard. You don't know that the reason you're being well fed is to fatten you up. So knowing the reason behind things can sort of, can sort of help. And there's this lovely idea um, that they're all, we have all these models of how the world can work, um, and none of them are actually reality. Every uh, map is, a, is an accident. Um, the, the difference between the, the map and the thing itself is always significant. Every model is wrong, but some happen to be useful. And going back to talking about uh, sort of the predictions that Kepler was able to make, um, and if you even go back before that, you go away from the heliocentric interest, uh, model of the solar system and Remember that Ptolemy and a, a lot of other very wise people calculated the way the world worked and the, the planets worked based on the Earth being at the center of the, the universe and things revolving around it. This model is wrong, as are all other models. It turns out, though, if you're doing uh, sextant navigation on the oceans, 
or navigation without using GPS of various sorts, this model still works really well. And it is exactly the model that is still taught in navigation school when every officer on a ship traveling around the world knows how to use an Earth centric version of the universe uh, in order to calculate where they are. So it is a useful model in spite of the uh, way that we know that it is completely wrong. Um, similarly, uh, relativity, when it came along, showed that the Newton models of motion were actually incorrect, um, but they're good enough until we get up to relativistic speeds. And this is also interesting. And we know also that relativity and gravitation are not compatible. One of these two models or both of them are in some sense wrong um, because they can't be brought together into a single unified model, at least not yet. Um, and there are certain things about each of those models that contradict each other. So it's really interesting to know that all these models are moving along. Um, and one of the ways that we work out or think about whether a model is uh, useful or good or bad or better than another one is usefulness on one side. But also very importantly, um, simplicity. Uh, Occam's razor is about the simplest possible explanation for a particular phenomenon. Um, and so this whole keep it simple, stupid uh, technique has been attributed to everybody from once again, Einstein usually gets mentioned, but I recently met, read that uh, George Young, who was the um, guitarist in the Easy Beats and the producer of ACDC, used to say exactly the same thing about music. So if you like ACDC, um, then the KISS principle, as you probably know, applies just as well to them. So we came away from um, all this sort of old uh, physics and mathematics that got developed. And as we came into the 20th century, things really accelerated. Um, Group theory became a thing that people really did all sorts. Basically, at the beginning of the century were the last mathematicians who understood all of mathematics. Um, everyone became more and more specialized. There was more and more to know. And people began to be able to make better and better predictions. Um, there's a huge number of these, whether it's breaking the Enigma codes in the uh, Second World War, but also there were things like um, doing weather predictions. The D-Day uh, landings were possible due to weather predictions and a whole bunch of other things. Um, nuclear physics was one of the things that uh, was very carefully modeled and calculated and um, prognoses were made, predictions were made that uh, by igniting the chain reaction, they weren't going to set fire to the atmosphere, though there was a bit of residual doubt there. There was a hope that somehow it wouldn't actually happen, though it wasn't completely uh, impossible. And so in some sense, futuring as a science began to emerge here. There was this idea that there were systems of things interacting and we could analyze these systems and begin to work out what was going to happen next. Um, and this was great. This meant that we could do things like uh, send rockets off into space and like have them sweep past planets and use these gravitational acceleration effects, which I have never understood and probably never will. I, I wasn't that sort of mathematics never really interested me. Um, we know more and more about the way that the universe is uh, constructed, the way the universe works, how cosmology works, how um, how uh, all these like very fine particles of the world work. And we've sort of gone off in all sorts of different wonderful directions. Um, this idea is because we can calculate how these systems work, they become predictable. Um, and because we know that some of the things we can only measure with certain accuracies, then we have levels of confidence. And we can say with the 95% certainty, this system will develop in this way um, or within these bounds, this sort of thing. Sorry, because I'm in Australia now, I have to say good night to my door. Um, and the idea is that through these predictions, we should be able to control them. If we can write down what we're going to do to the system, then we should be able to predict what that change or that control will do and be able to actually adjust it in ways that we want it to. So this was the first great like, era of futuring when all the think tanks and RAND and such organizations came into existence, came into existence after the Second World War and started building these amazing systems. And um, a huge boom happened because we were able to apply technology and apply mathematics to all sorts of things to be able to build new technologies with those technologies to do better mathematics and backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And all these interesting things began to happen. Um, this was yes, this was when futuring really, really emerged. And so one of the things that all this sort of mathematics and technologies enables us to do is to make these predictions, these extrapolations. We do simulations, 
So uh, as you can see here from this picture, we want to talk about climate. So in the climate um, modeling, they basically run a whole bunch of simulations and look how things might change. Uh, it's a it's a very yeah it's a very abstract sort of model, um, but it's sort of long term model. And uh, one of the things that we find when we're looking at the descriptions that are used and talking about this, if anyone's read an IPCC report, I've only read um, sections of summaries. Every single sentence has a paragraph as a bracket at the end that says high, pro high uh, probability, very high probability, very, very, very high certainty. They have certain ways of talking about, about this that mean something very specific. I think this is really interesting. These modeling, with these modelings, they're able to say things that are with certain degrees of predictability, certain degrees of certainty um, are going to be true. And this is uh, sort of the whole issue that we're dealing with as a, as a society and are going to be dealing with into the future. I do notice that um, South Africa's still got a bit of green down the bottom, so that's not like you're going to be too bad, but Cape Town, near where you are, um, I think is going to be a bit more sort of met by problems, um, as is Australia where I am. So by these predictions, we're in all sorts of trouble. Of course, prediction is one of these interesting things because it's very hard to know what's going to happen to any of us in the next couple of weeks because many things might happen. It's very hard to make predictions about our health in a couple of weeks. It is pretty certain that in 120 years, we're not going to be able to sit down and have this conversation um, because some things are pretty predictable. What is interesting is that we're now able to do not only on large scale uh, global simulation, but actually look at predictions on a very on a more localized level. Um, and so this is one of the areas of future that we get interested in and involved in is going and looking at what does it actually mean for a city. So here's the city of, I always forget which one it is. This is the city of Charleston, I think, in, um, yes, Charleston in South Carolina. And this shows what might happen with a sea level rise of six feet um, and how much of the city is going to disappear. So it takes you away from being just like, it's going to get warmer, which people in Canada might be happy about, to it's going to flood uh, a town. But I must admit that I don't really know where um, South Carolina is on Charleston. I know there's a Charleston in the UK, which is a lovely little harbour side, uh, well, uh, seaside harbour. Um, are that important? And I found this is also quite interesting. It looks at a comparison in London of uh, different degrees of warming and different degrees of ocean level rise and prediction of how that's going to affect the uh, areas of London. And I can begin to sort of understand, okay, just there's there's streets and and part neighbourhoods are disappearing there. The way the Thames runs might end up changing because it's going to be moving through those uh, parts of London in different ways. Um, so it could be really interesting changes. One of the things that we find most interesting is this question of dealing with uh, experience. So I have to keep my notes over here on the same page. Um, and this is from a series of uh, modified photographs called Postcards from the Future. Um, from Royal Graves and Didier Maddox Jones, where they've taken various standard scenes of the world and have then uh, thrown them forward into a future and looked at how they might look like. And so London as Venice is quite interesting because I've stood next to that, um, that eye wheelie thing. I've walked over one of those bridges. I've seen Big Ben, not only on television when I was growing up, but I've sort of walked past it. And so there's a certain degree of immediacy and reality to what's going on in this picture that gives me an experience or an idea of being there that's a little bit more visceral than just looking at a map and what's happening in it. So that's sort of some of the work that we do is crossing over from these more sort of abstract ideas into the concrete ideas. Um, and so in some sense, we're using but very abstractly the powers of mathematics to think about uh, what's going on there to find things out. Um, and what we do when we're doing it is we build like even more specialised things. We build little sections of future towns. So one of the things that we do, um, this is the town square of Turton, um, where you can actually walk in there and walk around. You can visit things. Uh, you can knock on a door. You can peer through a window. Um, you won't meet any people from there, but you might hear them speaking, um, particularly if you walk into the bar. So here's a bar with a bunch of posters of events that are happening. And so we try and represent um, what's going on in a very everyday sort of level in that possible future, um, even down to the point of uh, creating a 32 page newspaper from that future. And so where we get to talk about a lot of what's going on in, in the world, what's interesting in that town in the future and bringing it to life in a really important way. The photograph on the left is from the bar. And if you're sitting in the bar, um, 
you can put some headphones on and listen to the occupants of ch chatting with each other, um, dealing with everyday life issues like uh, algae infected seas and things. So we try and break this down into experience the wolf stuff, like experiential futures is this sort of genre of work. So this is an uh, important area. And so if we come back to, um, if enough time at the end, I'd like to show you a video about this. Um, if you're interested, I can share the link with you. Um, but this sort of takes us off very much away from the mathematical area of things and into the sort of more communication ideas. In some sense, what we're doing is we're taking complex mathematical, uh, mathematical ideas and models of how the world might be and breaking them down into experiences that people can have, um, which is sort of interesting. Prediction, as we know, is difficult. There's a old Danish saying, which is sometimes attributed to a physicist, um, but it's older than the physicist. Um, at least it's widely agreed upon to be Danish, is that prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Previously, we've talked about this idea of certainties and probabilities with a certain certainty. Certain statements can be made about how the weather might, uh, the climate might uh, develop, or the certainties can be made with a high certainty, we will be able to control the robot and make it land on the lunar surface um, without crashing, these sorts of things. Um, and there's all sorts of limits that come in to what's going on here. Uh, and but some of those limits aren't a problem. One of the things that I just came up to get today once again is this thing that um, I was just getting rid of some bits and pieces of mail and there's this advertisement saying to have a, a cancer screen uh, aimed at women, I believe. Um, but same thing for in my age, looking at prostate cancer is these screenings are extremely good at uh, predicting whether we're likely to be having to deal with prostate cancer in the next little while or breast cancer. So a lot of these predictions are extremely effective and mathematics has made our world so much better. What happens though with um, nonlinearity is that things get complicated and all of a sudden we can't break down a bunch of influences and look at each influence by themselves and they just add them back together. We need to look at the combinations and what they do together in very nonlinear, interesting ways. And all of you hopefully heard a little bit about chaos theory, this idea that very small changes lead to very big changes. Um, butterflies' wings lead to a thunderstorm, that sort of thing. It's all about exponential growth in, in limited environments where all of a sudden things just get completely mixed up. Another um, very interesting uh, part of these sort of prediction problems is positive feedback. Once you begin to get positive feedback, you also get exponential growth. And uh, positive feedback can then lead to uh, inc vast increases in inequality, for instance, just a, a small inequality to start off with, a few advantages to certain people, and all of a sudden their um, advantages explode and explode. And this is a, a very serious part of uh, dealing with prediction because you can hardly see those differences at the beginning, but they explode over time. Um, Another example is uh, with prediction is that to do good prediction, you need to be an expert. As a mathematician, we are all learning to be experts in very particular areas. And these have recently come to be known as silos. This idea of very tall, thin area where we're an expert and we can go into that silo. We can work very detailed. We can dive deep down into a particular area of the algebraic modeling of computation systems or um, quantum computation or whatever it is that's your favorite thing to do. That's why we have so much specialization. But the people in each of these silos can't speak to each other. Getting um, communication between the various silos is very difficult. Um, and this also happens in business, in government, everywhere else. Um, this expert expertise and these specializations break down sort of all sorts of problems. And most of the interesting systems can't be kept within a silo, but actually spread out beyond the silo. And therefore, the experts need to begin to talk to each other. And that is quite difficult sometimes. Um, yeah, for an, a good example of that is uh, there is a very expert idea of um, markets being a perfect pricing mechanism. A market will always find the perfect price for something because uh, that's mathematically proven. Uh, a friend who is a economics professor um, said this was probably one of the most frustrating uh, teaching experiences that she would have every year is she would teach the markets are perfect uh, result, mathematical result, and all of the presumptions that it has, it assumes perfect information for all participants, it assumes uh, zero friction costs and a bunch of other things. I'm not an economist. Um, and in that particular environment, then a free market will give perfect pricing and fair distribution of, of the goods. 
the people walk out, the students walk out, and all they remember is markets are good. They forget all of these details and they take this expert knowledge and they try and apply it outside the silo. And that leads to all sorts of problems. They believe that they can predict that things will work well, and in fact, they don't. That's a, a good, interesting problem. Um, and so we are left with this problem of transdisciplinarity when we're trying to do interesting predictions into the, about the future or about possible futures then uh, we need to have people talking across uh, their silos. And so really, the, in the socio-political economic sort of area, there's no one knows everything. There's a lot of theory. Economics would like to be a mathematical theory, like physics or chemistry, um, or like mathematics. But it's not. Uh, economics is wonderfully self-referential. By the time you've understood something, someone's used that understanding to break the way that it works. It's a very human system. Economics is built by humans, for humans, and used by humans, and changed by humans. So it's very uh, self-undermining. And same with social systems and political systems. They're, um, they're all human constructs and go off in all sorts of different ways. There is no expertise. There's lots of localised expertise, but no general expertise. In technology, in some sense, there are many experts because there's a lot of people doing a lot of very interesting things and taking technology off in very interesting ways. And so socio-political, economic and technological changes and developments are very, very hard to, um, to look at as what's going to happen next because there's lots of things happening and lots of weird interactions happening and just things are developing in all sorts of crazy ways. So collaboration is extremely necessary. And moreover, we're going to come back to this, this whole question of good questions. Um, once again, I'm going to quote the, um, the, the Einstein fellow, and I'm sure there's other people who have said similar things, is that if you're given an hour to solve a problem that your life depends on, you spend 50 minutes working out what the right formulation of the question is, because then you only need 10 minutes to solve it. Um, and while that's not quite, we're not looking at solutions here, we're looking at good questions. This ability to be able to phrase very good questions is important. And I think that many of you in mathematics, especially mathematics research, will know exactly the same situation where you need to be able to ask what is the sort of research question that I can deal with so that I don't end up with just another little tiny incremental change on previous mathematical developments, but actually have a, uh, an interesting question that gives interesting answers that will be of value to other people. This is a, a good and difficult question. And one of the ways of dealing with this, um, blah, 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 is that by having those good questions, you come up with uh, ideas of what might happen next, you come up with possible solutions. But because we don't have any expertise and we can't actually make complete predictions, then the technique that's used in uh, doing future in work is to have scenarios. Um, we know that the scenarios that we develop are not correct. What we do try and do is to have the scenarios go in different directions so that we've contemplated a number of different possibilities where things might go out to. Um, so uh, the reason we want to do this is so that we can say, okay, if this sort of thing changes, it might go in that way. This sort of thing changes, goes in that way. These two things change together, it might go that way. If they change together in a different direction, we get a different scenario. And because we've contemplated a variety of possibilities, we're not locked into one view of how the world's going to be and are able to then, we as a group, whoever this group is, um, are able to imagine better things and they've exercised their ability to imagine. So even though they know that none of these four or eight or whatever things are going to happen, they have thought about the many things that might happen so that what does happen is less of a surprise. Um, and a very important bunch of uh, questions that come in here, excuse me, I'm just trying to organize my slides, um, is to think about what's what's important, what's important to us in these uh, in these scenarios and how they might, might develop. And in particular, um, when we look at sort of possible scenarios, we come across something, a description by a guy called uh, Voros, the Voros cone, which looks at the way things are going to be happening in the future. We have the projected future, uh, the most probable future. Imagine that everything is going to keep on going like it is now. Then in the projected future, so the green uh, line, the middle of these uh, concentric cones, is the most probable thing is going to happen. So then we have probable things that are going to happen. There's probably not going to be things that are changing much, how a current trend is going to keep developing. Um, and so within this, we have, as you can imagine, this time is the uh, axis left to right. On this like two-dimensional surface are all the various scenarios spread out. Then we've got scenarios that are not very improbable, but they could happen. 
we, as far as we know, with the technologies that we have, it is plausible that people will be plonked on the surface of Mars by Elon Musk and his cronies um, within the next 20 years. That's plausible. It might not be probable because there's a whole bunch of things that are making that more difficult, but it's plausible. And some people would even think that it's probable in certain um, communities, probably they think it is a problem. For other people, it's plausible that a, uh, not a cold fusion, but at least a fusion reactor might come into existence and be able to produce more energy than it is put into it, and therefore it could give us a clean, uh, large scale energy source using nuclear resources. That's plausible. It's not very probable in the next little 20, 30 years, but it's, it's, it's plausible. And then there are things like uh, cold fusion, which is one of the favorite examples that we like not people not to think about too much. Um, it might happen because at the moment there is no completely fundamental reason why it can't happen. Uh, we're pretty sure that um, warp drives can't happen. They're, in, they're uh, outside of the possible part of the cone. But within it, there's some things like we can't out and, uh, strike out the possibility that cold fusion um, or aliens might arrive. These in the, in the future and field are known as sort of wild cards and they're usually, those two in particular, are the ones that we try and not work with because they basically break everything. Because, and this is where we want to come back to what we're talking about here, um, the reason we talk about the future isn't to stay there. We're not going to talk about the future and just live in this fantasy world of what might be around in 30 years time. But we go to the future in order to think about it and then come back to now and act in the now once we've thought about what might happen in the future. And if we spend all our time thinking about alien invasions, we're probably not going to make very good decisions about what we need to do tomorrow. So this is very important. Um, sorry. Yes. So in order to come up with these imaginations, we're trying to get groups of people together, groups of multiple people, multiple ideas where they're coming from, multiple expertises. We run through formal processes that are facilitated. Um, we try and get people to talk about what they think is important, what they think is good, what's going to happen, what should happen, uh, what their fears are about what might happen. We try and use good questions in order to get them to say interesting things. And we try and get them and ourselves to make explicit statements. And this is a very important idea. Donna Mellows, who's a very interesting uh, system scientist, mathematician, um, and a bunch of other interesting things that she did before she unfortunately died in the early 2000s. Um, I'm just going to read a quote from her. Getting models out into the light of day, making them as rigorous as possible, testing them against the evidence and being able to scuttle them if they are no longer supported, is nothing more than practicing the scientific method. Something that is, uh, is done far too seldom in science and is done hardly at all in the social sciences, management, government or everyday life. The only thing I'd like to say about us, I mean, we're all mathematicians, I believe you all are, um, is we're very good at making our explicit statements about the models that we're working with. And this, I think, is a very important and valuable contribution that we can bring to people doing all these activities is being able to listen to what they're saying and to analyze and dig down into it and get them to make actual clear explicit statements to get their models out in the open when they're saying something what they actually mean by it and to be able to say and we're used to this we make hypotheses about uh, conjecture about what might be true um, my notebooks are filled with uh, wild claim um, and which will then be disproved several pages later with a counter example. Um, but by making these wild statements and writing them down, we're often able to find out what the limits are to what can be done, what's happening in our systems. And this is a really important and valuable contribution that mathematicians can bring into the future and, and all these other communities, management um, and all these, all these areas. Clarity is really important. And when we're doing this, we try to make sure that when we bring a group of people together in a, one of these circles, this is a photograph before a workshop that we did, um, we try and make sure that everyone's feeling equal and everyone's going to be heard. One of the other features that we have as mathematicians is that some of us are very loud and some of us are not very loud. We all know the stereotype of the shy and retiring mathematician and the recently late John Conway um, tells a lovely story that he was a very shy mathematical, uh, mathematically gifted student when he was at high school. He was horribly, horribly shy, but he got a scholarship to go to Cambridge. And on his way to Cambridge, he realized that no single person from his childhood was going to be there. No one knew that he was shy. 
And he decided on the train not to be shy anymore and proceeded to become the outrageously charismatic John Conway, um, who did all sorts of interesting and fantastic things and was inspiring to all sorts of people. Um, and it's very interesting. He was able to make that choice. A lot of people aren't able to make that choice. When we work with people, we like to develop processes and we often use quite formal processes to encourage everybody's voice to come out. We've done this across language barriers. We've realized uh, that we've managed to deal with people who can't even read or write very well by having the techniques there to deal with language issues. And they've been able to contribute next to everybody else. And the shy people have been able to contribute next to the very loud people. And the loud people have been frustrated. They weren't able to make their loud statements. And that's also good because it means that people begin to work together and they collaborate. So this futures literacy idea is very much about a group intelligence and getting a lot of people to think together. Um, it's like numeracy or general literacy is very important stuff. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about uh, for a little while is study as preferred futures. We want to get groups to come together to use their group intelligence. I sort of said most of this already to reach sort of a democratic or a, if everyone agrees with these ideas that are being talked about to be very inclusive. And once again, one of the strengths that we have as mathematicians is we can follow internal logics very well. We're given a collection of axioms and ways of thinking, and we will put them together into what happens next. Um, and this is very important as we're developing a scenario. What if this and this and this happens? We can think through those ways of putting them together and following the internal logics of what, what that will mean. And this is very powerful. Um, so one of the examples of mathematics that we apply on a regular basis is we've got a group of, say, 25 people. And we want to have them have little, have little focus groups. We want to divide them up. Um, and we want to have put them into five groups of five. That's an easy enough thing to do. And then we're going to, they're going to talk to each other in groups and, and come up with a bunch of ideas. And then we want them to all get mixed up again and have another five groups of five where everyone talks to somebody else. And one of the ways, this is a combinatorial sort of question, can we do this in a, in a nice and easy way? Um, and we want to do that over and over again. We might have three or four rounds of people talking to each other in these breakout groups. And so combinatorics gives us a way of asking these sorts of questions. And if we take an affine space over Z5, and look at Z5 cross Z5, then we can just look at the six parallel classes of lines in that affine space over a finite field. And that gives us a way of just being able to create these groups um, and making sure that people aren't um, always sticking together, that everyone's being distributed quite nicely. And in fact, using that structure, we would actually know that everybody would sit with everybody else on a table exactly once, because we know that if a table is a line in our space, one of the, the collections of people, one of the groups, then we're all of a sudden going to have everybody mixed up wonderfully. And we're not going to have two people who are in conflict with each other sitting together for more than one round. So this is one of the things where we've got um, combinatorics, very simple mathematics uh, coming together. But once you start trying to work out how to do this, you've got a group of 34 people and you want to have uh, six groups of, no, you can't do that anymore. Being able to solve these sorts of problems is sort of also useful from a um, combinatorics question and has turned out to be useful. And this is the sort of thing we're talking about where this is, for instance, a group of uh, 90 odd people from a employment agency. And we got them to work together and to have a whole bunch of crazy ideas. And luckily, um, got them to all talk to each other and, and laugh a lot, which is sort of quite nice. Um, and yes, some of these people were a little bit on the spectrum, but they all seem to have a great time, which is nice. So the other thing I like to talk about is choices. So what do I mean by choices? Coming towards the end here, we want to be able to make preferences. When people are working together, they have to make decisions. Um, and when they're doing that, they want to make orders of things. Uh, so hopefully most of you know the difference between a partial order and a total order. Total order. Partial order is um, this idea we have preferences. Um, and that they're transitive. I like uh, A more than B than, and B more than C, then I like A more than C. The thing about a total order is it says that for any pair of objects, I have a comparison which one's above the other or below the other. Total order, partial order. And this comes up over and over again in the sort of work that we're doing. Um, so really, it's a very basic example. I've got a partial order of uh, preferences. If there's no real difference between trifle and cake in my dessert preferences, but no one really likes cheese. So if we've got on the um, right hand side, we have two total orders of these preferences. 
So if we're talking about a group of people who are me and my father, for instance, we both agree that ice cream is the best thing to have for dessert. We both agree that cheese is the thing we don't like to have for dessert, but we disagree about whether cake or trifle is better or worse than the other. Then one of the uh, problems that we come up with over and over again, we want to order things. We have different orders from different people and we need to move from a total ordering, like on the right hand side, to a partial ordering, like on the left hand side, about what the group of my father and I uh, want to have for dessert, where we don't really have a preference between trifle and cake because we can't work out what's going on, which means that we need to try and make sure we have ice cream for dessert, which is usually what we manage to do, which is much more important. Um, and this turns out to be a problem when we're dealing with something like Arrow Theorem. So Arrow Theorem, once again, comes from economics, but it's a nice, solid mathematical theorem. Um, and it says if you've got a bunch of people making a ranking of their preferences about how, how things should develop in a democratic system, um, if you want these four relatively clear uh, things that should be fair, you want to have the, the non-dictatorship so that there's not one person who makes all the decisions. Um, that Pareto efficiency comes in there. This is this idea that if everybody likes A over B, then A should win over B. Um, this is quite clear. Um, if the independence for irrelevant alternatives is if, uh, one of the ways of describing it is if in the middle of an election um, or between the election and deciding who won, one of the, pay, the uh, alternatives, one of the presidential candidates dies, then the same result should come out with that person removed. It shouldn't actually change the complete uh, ordering that comes out as a result. And last but not least, um, no matter what we do, uh, it should still work, this unrestricted domain. And Arrow theorem basically says that we cannot get a democratic system of complete orderings that works, that's like this, that has all these things. And this was very interesting for us. So there's mathematical models that say that the sort of decision making that we'd like to do in a uh, scenarios workshop is difficult or impossible. For instance, we have to allow partial orders rather than total orders is one possible solution to part of these things. Um, and allowing multiplicity in the decisions that we make going into the future. Another problem that we come up with uh, is um, in economics, in rational choice theory, there's this idea that we can always make a choice between two things. If we're given the choice to be uh, paid some overtime for doing extra work, or we're gonna go home early, we should be able to make that decision. Um, this is equivalent to saying that there is a total ordering. And this has the unfortunate uh, corollary that everything can be compared to a bunch of money, which means that everything has a price. And of course, this is nonsense. Um, but this idea of forcing choices into total orderings um, means that uh, we get sort of bad things and silly things coming out, but it is a basis for much of economic uh, modeling that goes on. Once again, economics is a fantastic way of applying mathematics. It just doesn't always work. Um, in terms of thinking about internal logics, which I also wanted to talk about before, so I've just taken in a few examples of where things are interesting, where mathematics comes in. Um, in the two by two matrix from Schwartz, uh, which is a very classical uh, futuring scenario idea. You essentially take two questions, two trends, look at the ways they might develop in extremes. And so you get a two by two matrix where you basically mix those two, those four extremes of the two possibilities in the two directions. And then we get these four quadrants. And then we think through the internal logic of those implications and think them out. And as you can see here, this is a workshop that we did with people in a uh, Futures of Work Environment in Romania last year. Um, there was all sorts of details came out about where things could go uh, in this sort of internal logic idea. So this is one of the things that we end up doing. Lots of internal logic, lots of following our noses, lots of trying to maintain uh, rationality. And uh, as mathematicians, we know that we're doing, we're solving problems. One of the things that we get laughed at is at the end of a paper we will often write, which opens up further questions for research whereas people in management like to hear, and that solves that problem, so now we know how to do that. Thank you very much, goodbye. Um, so yes, what we're doing is pure research, and futures is all pure research. Uh, we do a lot of thinking around axiomatics. What are the axioms from which we want to be working? Um, and one of the good examples of axiomatics, which I just have to bring in here, um, is that if you're an abstract algebraist, which some of you hopefully are, not just Karen and myself, um, is that if you take a set of axioms, like the axioms of a field, and you take away the commutativity of addition, then you actually don't lose anything because from the other axioms, you can prove that the addition is commutative. If you take away the commutativity of multiplication, 
you actually do get something different. Um, you get something called skew fields. Turns out in the finite case that they're all, all skew fields are actually commutative, so you don't actually lose that, that axiom. So you're talking about axioms and losing axioms. Whereas if you, if you take away one of the distributive laws, you get something called nearing, uh, near field, which is actually different. Though you do get for free the commutativity, commutativity of addition again. So when you think about axiomatics and what the things are that you want to have, if you're doing sort of mathematical thinking, and then when you translate that into future thinking, you're thinking about what are the basis of a possible future and what can you take away that will sort of actually make that future fundamentally different or not. Are you, um, by taking one possibility away, are you actually opening up new visions? And one of these visions, the things we like to say when we're having these discussions is a strong vision weekly held, which, um, what I was mentioning before about the wild claims, when we're uh, doing some research, one of the things that we like to do internally is to say, based on very few um, examples, this seems to be a pattern. Let's write down what we what would be the hypothesis, what would be our, our, the our theorem if this was true all the time. So we have a strong hypothesis, strong claim, and as soon as we find why it's wrong, we get rid of it. But we actually make these strong statements to imagine these strong statements and then look at the ways that they break so that we can actually do some thinking about these extremes. We think out into the future of the research that we're doing and then imagine what happens if that's true and then we work out why it doesn't work. Um, because we like to do a lot of reductio ad absurdum, which is of course one of the first proof techniques that we learn in, in university. And last but not least, examples. Examples in mathematics are the things that we use to create understanding and evidence. We like to have examples to play with, um, whatever the level of example that you need to work with. When we work in futuring, we actually like to build uh, examples. We like to build an experience of walking into a possible future to create a better, underst better understanding of that um, possible future. And that's sort of work that we like to do. I would show you the video now, but it's now 5-2 and people will want to go. So I'll say thank you for listening. Thank you to Lorenz for uh, Lauren, I think I almost pronounced it correctly. And to Karen for inviting me, to our supporters, and thank you to you for listening. Thank you very much.